Good morning, everyone. Um, we're not getting started early today, so um, but I did want to try and keep us uh, on track. Um, Patrice Kunish was in a, a, a little a, a fender bender accident this morning and has been delayed. She's fine. She said there were several cars on the ramp and she couldn't get her car out of um, the um, all of the cars that were stuck there. So she said she thought she'd be here in about an hour. So um, my name is Anita Fine Day, and she asked me if I would just get us started this morning. So I. Between um, Dick and I, we um, think we can fill her shoes. And uh, so I'm going to get us started. And um, I'll just say that I'm uh, Anita Fine Day. I'm with Casey Family Programs. And we've partnered with the Federal Reserve Bank today and yesterday to, um, to make this event happen. And, um, and I, so we're going to start. Um, we, we have a, um, a speaker this morning who's not uh, on the agenda, but we wanted to make um, time to have Dave Archambault Sr., uh, who is an elder from the Standing Rock Reservation. We wanted to give him a few minutes um, to um, address the crowd. So, um, and I, I told him this morning, I said, I didn't know him, but uh, probably lots of you know his daughter is uh, Jody, uh, Jody Gillette, and his son is Dave Archambault, the chairman at Standing Rock. So um, we are um, certainly very happy to have him with us today, and I'd welcome him to the podium. Good morning, folks. I'm real happy to be here. I've uh, um, come in from Fort Yates just uh, from the reservation yesterday. My wife and I, that's my wife over there. Please stand up. She's uh, so special. She's a gem, you know. <laughs> Me and that one's been together for almost 50 years. Dang, pretty, just a year or so short of that. Um, she's a Pine Ridger, Ogallala. Um, they're real hard boiled, them women. <laughs> they're made of uh, concrete, rusted nails, and barbed wire. Them ones are why they're tough. Anyway, uh, that's why. Uh, but she's also a great, an educator, and we're talking about early childhood education. And she's a Montessorian of those that know anything about that. She's certified in. Zero three three six six nine nine twelve plus a master's degree from a cell. So um, and it's something that we've always been uh, really interested in. How we got here right now is we have a she has a uh, a first cousin in Indian way that's a, a brother. His name is Sam Y Nelson, and he is in town here and he's been at our camp at uh, that's the, this uh, demonstration that's going on on our reservation against the pipeline. And he came over here is with some relatives and we're coming to get him again. He's, so he's been there, he was there about a month and came back for about a, a week or two and now he wants to go back. It's kind of contagious, you go over there and that, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, pretty pitiful. Uh, the, the people are uh, in makeshift tents, you know, pup tents and stuff like that and all over the place with teepees and various kinds of wall tents or whatever, so uh, it's it's pretty meager if you, it's like camping out, and so it ain't a luxury living, that's for sure, so if you go there expecting a really uh, nice of these, it's, it's, it's kind of tough, but it's the spirit that's going on there that's really, really, really remarkable. Um, so we're coming to get him, and uh, she's going, taking him back, and he'll be braving the weather there, it's going to get real cold. I'm going on, I, I got to leave, I can't stay here too long, but... The way it worked out, I just uh, asked Patrice if uh, you know uh, about this, and she it would like to have me come and speak. So I, let me say I, I'm uh, I, I have had education um, uh, at my at uh, I guess uh, my heart for a long time. I was an educator at Little Moon School on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and uh, I worked there for several years. And then I just I coached, and we had really good, outstanding state 
teams, state champions, the Indian boys that were there that, was, that I had. Uh, but we weren't doing well in education at all, our kids were. So we, what we did was, uh, I, I went uh, to Penn State to look at that, to see what we could do. And, and it's been since that time in 84 when I left there. That's so, it's almost uh, 94, 104, 30 some, 34 years, 30, 30 some years now that I've been uh, working at uh, improving education, uh, finding out, uh, I, I've studied it, I know what's, what, what the deal is on it. Um, and I'll just say that putting kids in, in boxes by age, uh, giving them state content, which is pretty much mandated by Every Child Succeeds Act or No Child Left Behind before that, you give them content that you believe that's good for them, um, and then you test them, and then you uh, label them. That doesn't work. That is not working. So I, I'm, I'm pretty well uh, knowing of models that work, okay? If you, you we, Indian country should get rid of that model, trash it, get away with it. And I was instrumental in getting a law passed in North Dakota to South Dakota. Uh, the governor and the director of education says, they just admitted that it isn't working. That model I just described, a standard K-12, does not work, okay? We know that for hundreds of years, 100 years of it. Looking at the data, you'll just say, you keep doing that, next year is going to be the same. You keep doing that, next year after that's going to be the same. So, we need to do something else, and that would be um, there are models that work at each child's talents and skills, and that would be Montessori is one of them. It's called self-directed learning. There's uh, cooperative learning models. There's ability-based models. There's uh, um, customized learning models. Uh, so there's 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 the five models, and you can kind of make, get a mixture of each, and that's that's probably the best. So I, I, and I as far as my opinion, I when I was at Penn State, got my master's degree, I I was looking for the answer, and one of my professors said, "Why don't you go over to that school over there? They do something different because it was all all the data was the same, everything was doing the same, plus everybody's arguing," and uh, I walked into a really remarkable uh, atmosphere. But at the same time, I was at uh, with uh, before this too as well, I had, there's a, a couple that's world famous in, in, in Lakota country anyway for singing. And that was Matthew and Nellie Tubles, and they worked at the Red Cloud Indian School. So I went with them, I went with, over there with them, and they were teaching these kids, these preschoolers, Lakota language. Uh, if you want to develop the brain, that's I guess the most important thing, I, and I would love to, have, I wish, uh, 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 Stephen Hughes was here, anybody know him? He'll tell you, that guy's a psychologist, he'll tell you how important it is to get this synapsis working, those links going, and Montessori is it. Probably, if you walk into Montessori, there's thousands of things to do, and they can choose anything they want, you know, and I, 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 had, I, I wish I could show you some pictures that, of the school that we had. Uh, but it's, it's the way to go, i just tell you that, and that's what we need to do. And it can be carried on to the high school. Project-based learning is another one, I guess. It's pretty well known in, in, in Minnesota. So there's some five models where you can work at. Uh, uh, our, our local people call it Nari, which is the, um, the spirit of a human being. Everybody has it. Maria Montessori called it the spiritual embryo. She was called it spiritual embryo. Our people call it Nari believing that there's a power within each and every one of us, human beings. And if you nurture that power, you will get the best out of that human being. In schools, we don't, do, we don't nurture that at all. We say, this is what's good for you. You understand what I'm saying? And it turns a lot of them off. It turns off about 35% of people drop out in America. That's non-Indians. Indians, it's much higher than that. So these models are uh, out there. Um, Early childhood, I would say, that's where it's all at. If you talk to most people, that are people that in the know, they'll say, get them wired up, get those brains wired up, in, so they have order, concentration, uh, coordination, uh, experiencing success. So a Montessori environment is giving a whole bunch of these little kids, a whole bunch of little tiny challenges that get increasingly strong, harder for them to do, or they get more, and, but it wires their brain much better, and you, you get a much uh, better intellect flowing out of that human being. So you got intellect going, plus if you do it speaking the language, 
and they'll tell you that picking up languages, uh, several of them, if you do that in an environment with little kids, uh, Maria Montessori called them sponges. They just they're they're, they're waka. Uh, in our language, that means they're 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 sacred. They're spirit. They're, they're holy, and they have a special ability to learn uh, at that time. So they can just pick up languages like that. Uh, so there's that's a, a key time. You get a, a rich rich environment, letting them pick it, and then like having Matt, Matt and Nelly Tubo go right behind them and, and explaining these activities. So you can teach language, several languages and you wire the brain real good. So um, I would encourage you, if you guys got anything to do with this, it's, there's Waldorf, there's Gazelle, there's Montessori, but I would say Montessori is the best program. We have some good ones. Molly O'Shaughnessy over here. Uh, my wife was at that one. She's been in Denver. She's been to several trainings all over the place for Montessori. But here you have an excellent, excellent place to learn. I would get you, I would, if the best thing you can do for the future of Indian country is get going on that track. You will develop the intellect of a human being much, much better. Uh, she believed in peace, Maria Montessori, and you see it. You will see that uh, this, uh, the way it's the way she this genius of a woman did this in the 18, late 1800s into the I think she died in the 40s 47 or something. That's the way to do it. So I would tell you guys uh, in a quick message I'm on what they call it. I'm going to say this uh, in in uh, Lakota we say adios. I'm adios here pretty quick. Leave the stage here, but but um, but. Uh, uh, Get that to you, to these people. Encourage it and force it down their throats if you have to. I mean, really. I mean, you just we just got to do this. If you've got a young lady, you just have to have a love and for children and stuff, and you'll see that you'll see them blossom because they they. Uh, I'll ask one question. Uh, what comes first, self-esteem or achievement? Which comes first? How many think self-esteem comes first? How many thinks achievement comes first? Okay, well, it's uh, achievement comes first in, in a human being. By, and that's what a Montessori environment does, gives them lots of little tiny challenges and they conquer them and they feel better about themselves. So if you wanna, you, they have to have successful act, uh, challenges and, they, and, and that's what a Montessori does, that helps them so they feel good about themselves. So then. They have somebody walking through. If you have somebody that doesn't feel good about themselves, you have somebody that takes is not so uh, peaceful or harm is is not good to other people. But I know you guys got an agenda, and I know you got a, uh, a nice program. Uh, I would just say, you know, if you guys could, if you got anything to do like that, uh, we're, we're in a battle for uh, actually uh, Mother Earth. It's it's sacred. Uh, that's uh, in our DNA as, as uh, indigenous people. And uh, uh, I don't know what did this. I'll tell you that our, our tribe, but we got hundreds of tribes coming to our camp. Uh, and they all come there and they say, they tell the same story. They tell of injustices that they come, they come, they, we invite them to a podium, not a podium, but a, a microphone. And they tell who they are, where they come from, and they say they've been treated not, not good. And why, and so our, our story is just the same, but why it took off like this, all hundreds of these tribes are coming together to support us. So we're, we're, uh, um, we're on the higher ground. This is that pipeline does not have to be built. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you got two choices, going underground or above ground. And they're both, we're, uh, they're, uh, anyway, it is, is, doesn't have to be built. Uh, doesn't wouldn't hurt anybody in North Dakota. Common economy would probably do better without it. No doubt about it. They pull the oil, the crude oil, up, and then they put it underground. And North Dakota never sees the resource again. Whereas if we keep it above ground, then we have businesses and people working. But anyway, I just say uh, if you can do anything to help out the tribe, uh, I'd sure appreciate it. It's a, it's a, it's the right thing to do. Hey, uh, have a good time. Uh, thank you for listening.
Well, I'll fill in briefly for Patrice to get us going this morning. Um, I think uh, I want to just um, move us along. I was going to make a few remarks, but I think I'm going to skip over a, a couple of my own remarks and just kind of move us along so that we give uh, our, our presenters a full uh, scope here of their time. And Rob, if we need to, uh, we're about, about five minutes behind at this point. So if we need to, we'll, we'll take five minutes out of the uh, time after the breaks or whatever. Yeah. So our, um, we've got a couple sessions coming up before the break this morning, very important ones. Uh, first one here on maternal and child health, and then one on tribal college and university early childhood education initiatives uh, before our first strategy circle. And for the first one here on maternal and child health, we're going to have actually a co-presenter, uh, not only uh, Jackie Dion, who is uh, just briefly, you've got the bio in your packet, but briefly serves as the uh, uh, Minnesota Department of Health's first director of American Indian uh, Health and uh, Tribal Liaison. Uh, and she's, you know, really, um, Jackie's there when you're out, on the, out in the uh, various meetings around the, the cities, at least, uh, where I've been. I don't get out a lot. Uh, Jackie's there. Jackie's very much a presence in this space. And she's going to be joined by um, a colleague, uh, Carla Decker-Sorby, uh, who's a tribal nurse consultant with the Family Home Visiting Section at the Minnesota Department of Health. I think uh, Carla, Carla works, I believe, out of northern Minnesota, maybe out of Bemidji. Is that right? Yeah, Bemidji. So we had Bemidji for, with uh, Dr. Troyer yesterday. We got a good Bemidji representation at this conference. So I'm going to just turn it straight over to um, Jackie and uh, Carla. Uh, and if there's some time later, sometime later in the program, there's a few, uh, few catch-up remarks I may make. But I think in the interest of getting uh, full time for our, uh, this presentation and the next one, let's, let's get into it. Thank you. OK. OK. Good. okay. Thank you and good morning. Um, again, my name is Jackie Dion, the Director of American Indian Health for the Minnesota Department of Health. I'm an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Tribe. Um, and I want to apologize to my elders for being in front speaking, and I'm so honored to have an elder speak before me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I um, have worked over 20 plus years in our urban American Indian population, predominantly in Minneapolis. Um, and then since 2005, um, started working for the state agencies, first with the Department of Human Services in serving older American Indian adults throughout the state. And now since May of 2012, um, working at the Minnesota Department of Health, um, uh, working statewide on public health issues that are affecting the community. Um, and I want to say that, you know, we just don't have enough across the board for all of our population, both tribal and urban. And that um, in our urban population, we have even less opportunities because we don't have a tribe of which can help uh, with our efforts um, in our urban population. We really rely on county services and county partnerships in neighborhoods that have a population of American Indian folks. So with my work, I really try to think about how to have a statewide reach into the American Indian population, which is small, which is, like I said, is only 2% of the total population. So when we're in spaces, we maybe get our voice heard from the urban population. Um, tribes, when they're in spaces, somewhat have a, a, a more of effect here in Minnesota of getting their voices heard, because they're the 10th largest employer of the state. Um, with the 18 casinos that are operated here. So there's some political clout and there's that government to government relationship that tribes have. Our urban folks don't have that. And um, we really have to have our voice at the table regardless of whether or not we're at the table. That our children need to be there. Over 80% or more of all Indian kids go to school off the reservation. And in our child care centers, many of our parents are choosing options that are not specific to American Indian children. And those options have to be just as good for that Indian kid as they are for everybody else. So when, I, when we talk about advocacy, we talk about advocacy for the whole population. It's not a tribal, urban, against each other kind of conversation. It's about all of us in here together and really serving our, our folks. Our Indian families want just as much culture and tradition and language 
for their child as our tribal uh, partners do. Um, we have at the Minnesota Department of Health, both Carla and I were hired um, in 2012. Prior to that, there has been and continues to be reach into our, our, our population with home visiting programs. Um, but there was really a struggle. Um, and not to say we've smoothed it out since 2012, but I think we've made it a little bit better. Um, but before 2012, there was a real struggle in that partnership between the tribes and um, the state agency and home visiting programs. Um, the White Earth Tribe um, had the uh, McPhee grant before 2012, I believe, and we're just starting to uh, do the home visiting programs directly with federal funds, um, not state funds. But prior to that, all of our home visiting programs were done with state funds. Um, the state, when tribes lobbied um, the Department of Health, they were only giving home visiting dollars in a block grant, or just giving a block grant um, that was used, used for a number of different things, but block grant money to just the um, community health boards of which went to local public health entities, then maybe dollars went to the tribes. And tribes were saying, no, that's not okay. And we have this government to government relationship. We would like you to have a black grant directly to us just so that we manage it ourselves. And that happened. I can't remember when that happened. But every tribe, um, nine out of the 11, Shakopee does not. Uh, uh, they could get part of the black grant if they wanted to, but they choose not to. Um, they have a black grant of which to do maternal child health, teen pregnancy prevention, TANF, and what's called eliminating uh, health disparities, EHDI. And they're to take their dollars and split it between the three if they choose, or to keep it all in one of those three pots. It's their decision. Um, they range from anywhere from uh, $200,000 for smaller tribes up to about $700,000 for larger tribes. Um, but that still is not enough money to operate the, the home visiting programs that really are needed. Um, but it is an effort of the state to work with the tribes on that government to government relationship. So most of these dollars out of the black grant is what's used for the home visiting programs, except for the White Earth Tribe, which uses uh, dollars directly from the federal government for their McPhee program, Nurse Family Partnership, of which they had to work with the researcher um, to adapt it to a tribal community because as it is, as a standalone um, evidence-based home visiting program, it didn't quite fit a tribal program. They, they're now in the, the, the working with the researcher to adapt it to a tribal population. Um, the Fond du Lac tribe also does nurse family partnership, um, but with their state block grant dollars, not with federal dollars. Both tribes did apply. I'm not sure how many tribes applied for the McPhee money at the federal level. But in Minnesota, we just have the one tribe that gets dollars directly from, from the federal um, McPhee dollars. We have WIC programs in seven of the 11 tribes, all in northern Minnesota and Ojibwe tribes. They have a WIC site where they provide WIC services directly out of their clinics. And one urban American Indian specific site um, at the Indian Health Board. These sites um, give the vouchers, families come in and they do a lot of nutrition education with the moms when they come in for their appointments. They have babies weighed and they go through an assessment process. And I think it was mentioned yesterday that we have one of the highest rates of obesity of two-year-olds in the, in the state. The highest rate of obesity. And I didn't put the chart up here, um, I could get it. But the chart shows that American Indian two-year-olds compared to all other races has a gap that's about a significant gap on the chart. It's huge. Um, we are trying to initiate an effort to um, improve um, the obesity rate and, and nutrition efforts of uh, children on WIC um, and the, uh, the, the total population by um, organizing a breastfeeding coalition, tribal breastfeeding coalition and urban folks um, into a coalition to have that peer-to-peer -peer support to um, uh, support moms on, on their breastfeeding efforts. Um, we know that the most indigenous first foods for our babies is mo mother's milk, um, mother's indigenous food. And we don't have that high rate of breastfeeding. Most of our parents, because of a substance abuse issue or housing issue or, or um, abuse issue of that mom, you know, breastfeeding is an intimate relationship we have with our babies. And when you've been sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused, and have a substance abuse issue, that's not a real choice that moms make for themselves. Um, and we're trying to look at those efforts around trauma and breastfeeding and increasing that. 
So um, knowing that you know we have all of these situations and, and Carla is out there trying to do work within our tribal communities to um, do home visiting programs and support them as a technical assistance advisor, <laughs> she said, well, um, what, can, what can we do? And um, in 2013, she undertook an effort to bring family spirit here to Minnesota tribes. And it wasn't an easy process. It took over a year, almost two years, before we actually got the trainers here to do the training. The health department did pay for that uh, training for them to come um, to do the, the two week long trainings for the tribal partners. Um, and I said like two of the tribes implemented nurse family partnerships. The Fond du Lac tribe does both family spirit and nurse family partnership. Um, and in 2014, the health department issued a report, which I believe has helped with initiating more culturally specific type programs um, throughout the health department and advancing health equity. Um, advancing health equity came about because our commissioner is really um, advocating uh, the infant mortality disparity to be reduced. When he started at the health department, the infant mortality rate for um, African American and American Indians did not improve to the level of the white rate in 1980. And that is just not okay to be this far along since, the, since 1980 to today and still have a gap in the infant mortality rate. And part of that report, which was on the news, was a effort to lead that report with structural racism, which in a state agency report had not happened and labeled in a effort to, to address the issue of inequities in the state of Minnesota. So that got a lot of buzz and we're really trying to push that in. When we talk about structural racism, we talk about those barriers of which when moms go in for services, what are some of the conditions of which are impeding them to really be able to get the services they need for their children? And in Minnesota, it is true, we have racism throughout the state and that is just the, re the reality. And we need to address it at, at the structural level and hopefully then having it come down to the individual level. When systems say that this is not okay anymore, people either have to say, individuals have to say, do I want to work in this system or not? When they oppose the fact that we are not going to allow for these kinds of, of activities to happen in our institution anymore. So we talk about the breastfeeding rates um, in our tribal communities and, and trying to get a breastfeeding coalition going on. We've also um, had conversations in our, our early childhood um, experiences with uh, childhood um, Adversity. When we bring out adversity into the uh, programs, um, so we have low breastfeeding rates. What's wrong with the moms? What's wrong with the, the tribe? Why can't we increase it? What's going on? We're not doing a good job. When we talk about trauma and adversity, it gives the folks doing those services the ability to say, now somebody's listening to me. Now somebody knows why we struggle to get these um, programs to meet these accomplishments that we all want to meet, but that we have to do it in a different way. And part of my advocacy to both native, non-native populations is that it's not to lower expectations, but it's to right size the expectations for the conditions of which the population we're working with. And this is true in any population, not just in the American Indian population. So I'll let um, Carla talk about the implementation of family spirit Carla Decker. Good morning, thank you. So family, Jackie gave you a little bit of insight into how Family Spirit started in Minnesota, and so I'm just gonna elaborate that on that a little bit. So you can see, as the introducer said, if you go to any meeting in the state around American Indian policy, you'll see Jackie there, but you'll probably never see me unless you're a tribal nurse. Um, or a tribal health director, because I work on the ground with those folks um, in all 11 of our tribes. So Family Spirit is a unique program. It's different than NFP. It's different than Healthy Families of America. Those are the two other evidence-based programs that the Minnesota Department of Health um, initiates. It's home-based, it's family-based. That's pretty unique or pretty common among um, home visiting programs. Um, but it's taught by native paraprofessionals or licensed staff, but it was designed to be taught by folks that don't necessarily have a nursing degree, but folks that know intimately the culture and the strengths of the community. 
So it is very strengths-based. I promise I didn't, um, even though David, I think are related, I promise I didn't uh, prompt him to say any of this. We're very strengths-based. The curriculum is very strengths-based. We focus not on coming in and fixing your problems, but on using strengths to um, help people overcome challenges. And we also utilize traditional teachings. Um, we nurture that strength within people, again, as Dave said. So um, this is a really busy slide, but this just talks about when, when we looked at, when I first started the program and made all my visits to the 11 tribal communities, and we talked about what kinds of programs and services do they want for their maternal child health population, for their pregnant women and their families with children to age three. Um, what do they want? And so we looked at different programs. We looked at NFP, we looked at HFA, we looked at other evidence-based programs that were available. But uh, Family Spirit was the only one developed by and for uh, Native American families with the help of Johns Hopkins University. Um, and so some of the findings that they found that as we looked at the research, tribal communities found that there was increased maternal knowledge, increased maternal involvement, and decreased maternal depression in families who were enrolled in family spirit. Reduced parent stress, increased parent efficacy, and improved home safety attitudes. So moms were childproofing. Fewer behavior problems in mothers and fewer behavior problems in infants at one year. And this last one is really kind of the hook right now as we're dealing with a lot of opioid use. So higher impact among mothers who use substances at baseline. So that means that even moms who were pregnant or parenting and were using substances at when they were enrolled in the program, one year later, st statistically significantly, fewer moms were using substances. And so there's, there's more findings coming out, there's additional findings coming out, but these are the research, and you'll find all of this stuff in the um, materials that I laid out on the table. So the curriculum, it's really a, it is, an, it is a program that is based in education. So we really, these native paraprofessionals and, and nurses, we provide services, home visits to parents, pregnant women, and families with children to age three, intensive home visits over a course of often more than three years. And so what do we talk about for all of that time? Well, there's a lot of things. Prenatal care, infant care, parent skills, substance use prevention, child development, and maternal life skills. In fact, the lesson that I have there now that's um, open is uh, on self-esteem. And as, as our introducer, as our elder said this morning, how do you get self-esteem? It's through achievement. And so we, we talk about that. So it's not just how to diaper your baby, it's how to, which is important, but it's also how to raise your self-esteem, how to be um, an effective and efficient parent. And it's very based in science. It's an evidence-based program, meaning that it's met all of the requirements for HRSA's, um, published studies and peer-reviewed journals, among other things. And each um, community that I work with, it's not a cookie cutter program. Each community that I work with works with Johns Hopkins and MDH to, to plan for the program, to decide who are their home visitors gonna be, how are these services gonna be delivered, who's gonna be the target audience, what lessons are we gonna focus on, how are we gonna use this curriculum? So each tribal community gets to, um, make that program their own. So we, like I said, there's planning, training, and implementation. And so Jackie gave a little bit of background on how we plan for the program. We brought trainers in from Johns Hopkins. Um, they allowed me to become a trainer. So now when our original seven sites have a staff turnover or the program grows, I can train those folks. So now all of our sites are in the implementation phase, which all of you are in, I don't have to tell any of you in this room, that's the hardest part, right? That's keeping it going, sustaining. So in Minnesota, Jackie kind of talked about this already, so I want to just buzz through this. So we had interest, seven tribes were interested. We um, piloted a small training in, in Grand Portage that went really well and we got great feedback. So yeah, we're gonna invest money into this. We wrote a grant, we brought trainers here. I have to say we brought our Navajo sisters here in January when it was 30 below in Bemidji. <laughs> 
and they were such troopers. I have to tell their supervisors here. They were such troopers. But I just, I did overhear one say to the other, it's like, why would people live where the air hurts your face? <laughs> <laughs> but they never complain once. And the snow, it's like, there's so much snow, it looks like fake. <laughs> I loved it. They paid me back when I got to go down and train with them recently in Arizona in July, so. <laughs> and so we have ongoing implementation by seven of our, our tribal health offices. And they're really working to be creative and community-specific adaptations and working on billing. Over 200 families have been served. More than 500 people are served, have been served individually. We really include traditional teaching and language in our programs, which is encouraged in family spirit, and we're working on sustainability. So, Padamia. Thank you, Carla. So, as you can see, um, with some effort and support, a state agency can adapt and support and, and work in partnership with tribal communities. I know other states don't have the kind of relationship um, some of our Minnesota tribes, not some, I hope all of our Minnesota tribes have with our health department. Um, but we also have to remember that um, I know that there's a legal definition of Indian country. Um, it's in, it, it is a legal definition of what Indian country is. But I would say that um, the whole United States is Indian country. And Indian people, no matter where you live, need to have this, the, the quality services that is enjoyed by everybody, regardless of whether or not they're Indian or not, or where they live or their zip code. Um, someday, I'd like to walk into a space and have a conversation about the American Indian population not being the worst of the, of the situation. That's my hope. Um, that's kind of my goal here while I'm at the health department. I don't know if I'll achieve it as long as I'm there. Um, but it, it is one of those things where Family Spirit, our WIC breastfeeding coalitions, our efforts around our obesity and tobacco use that's culturally specific from a state agency will help with partnering with tribes. And it's, and it's really having the tribes lead those solutions and our urban population as opposed to coming in with a cookie cutter approach and expecting it to fit into a population that it wasn't intended for. Anything? Thank you so much and appreciate your time. And a sample of the curriculum, so please feel free to peruse it and ask any questions. And I do want to announce that we have one of the researchers, Christine, yeah. here uh, for Family Spirit from Johns Hopkins. Please, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we're going to pull up a slide here for you. And, and Kristen, if you want to just introduce yourself and, and uh, offer some comments. Thank you. So good morning. Um, my name is Kristen Speakman, and um, Carla's right. Um, I, I'm from uh, Minnesota originally, but I now live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, Johns Hopkins, I'm with Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health, and our headquarters are in Baltimore, Maryland, but we have 10 satellite offices in the Southwest. But I'm originally from Minnesota, and so my colleagues um, who are from the Navajo Nation, who are our senior trainers, you know, I said, oh, you guys are going to go to Bemidji in January. <laughs> I said, it's really nice, but I didn't really tell them what they were in for. So Carla, Carla uh, had to uh, sort of orient them. So they, they came back and they were like, these people are crazy. <laughs> I said, yes, they are. Only the hardy survive. So those of you who are from Minnesota and still have lived here your life, you, you are the hardy ones. Your blood is thick. The rest of us, we just move south. So, um, so I'm just going to share a little bit, I think, the next slide yeah, um, on our evaluation results. Um, as Carla said, this program was really unique. It was developed um, in partnership with the Navajo Nation, San, Carli San Carlos Apache, and White Mountain Apache Nations. And um, it was, it, we, we uh, started in 1995 and together with those tribes developed the curriculum. And then we did three randomized control trials. And so people who are in research, you know what that is. It's a long haul. But the reason we did that is because so much harm has been done with good intentions. And we feel like you've, we've got an obligation and a responsibility to test things to really make sure they work and that there's a strong evidence base to, to show it works. And 
we, we, even when we started this way back in the 90s, we had other tribes asking us, like, can we have this, can we have this? And we said no, because we, we need to test it first, because we don't know if it works. And if it doesn't, we don't want to waste your time, and we certainly don't want to cause harm. So we spent um, 10 to 12 years really doing this rigorous evaluation. And these, Carla showed the results. The results Carla showed in her slide were from the first year. Um, we initially had our first randomized control was through the child's first year birthday, and these results on the on the slide are the full random all three randomized controls through the child's third birthday, and what we found was statistically significant uh, improvements around parenting, maternal outcomes, and child outcomes. So. Um, we replicated the results that Carla showed in the three by three years. So we saw increased maternal knowledge, increased parent self-efficacy, reduced parent stress, and improved um, home safety attitudes around the parenting outcomes. Um, in the maternal outcomes, we found decreased maternal depression, uh, decrease, decreased substance use, and fewer behavior problems in mothers. Um, and the child outcomes, and this one I just want to spend a minute talking about because this is extremely significant, um, is we saw fewer behavior problems in children through age three, which is externalizing, internalizing, dysregulation. And so, you know, when you present that, people are like, oh, okay, well, good. So the kid doesn't cry as much as, you know, they, they might otherwise. But this is the first uh, early childhood program in Indian country and beyond that has ever found this. And what this predicts, and the literature has shown, that is if you can reduce these behavior problems in children at this age, you um, it predicts lower risk of substance use and behavior pro health problems over the life course. So we don't even have to. If we're doing this program and programs like this that can show this, we don't need to worry about opioid use in these kids later on, or abuse. We don't have to worry about the um, other behavior problems that we're working way downstream. So this was this is a huge finding. And um, I also want to reinforce what Carla said in that um, the decreased substance use and abuse um, among the mothers. Um, that's targeted early on and fast. And I think we heard it our, as our um, the first panel yesterday talking about if there's one thing you could do, you'd take the alcohol and drugs out of, of the homes or the families, particularly the mothers. And so this program is also doing that and was proven um, to do that. So. Um, yeah, so it's currently, Family Spirit is in currently 75 communities um, across, in native communities across 15 states. And most recently, um, some non-native communities have reached out because they have been so impressed with the curriculum and the outcomes that we're finding in Indian country. Um, and so we have uh, trained in Chicago, um, in inner city Chicago communities, as well as in St. Louis, Missouri. So it's the, you know, this I think, and we were kind of sharing this yesterday with Jackie, you know, uh, so often um, the mainstream models are adapted for Indian country. Well now Indian country developed this model and it's 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 a good it's a darn good model. It's one of the best in the country. We would say, and so now other other communities around the country are saying, "Hey, we want this," you know, and and from all different races want this uh, curriculum. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, we recently um, have gotten a, a grant from NIH to look at to expand. We the current the current um, curriculum has sixty three lessons. Um, and about, and Carla would know this better than I, she knows the curriculum back and forth, but I would say th at least three to five are focused on um, obesity, prevention, gestational diabetes, et cetera, healthy eating. We've got a lot of lessons on breastfeeding. But um, as Jackie pointed out in her, her talk so eloquently, the obesity rates of in Amer Native American children is, 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 is extremely high. And so we've gotten an NIH grant to develop a specific um, curriculum around um, obesity and overweight pre uh, prevention starting at, pre at gestation, so before the baby's even born. 
most of the studies that have been done are done at um, f for preschool age children, and they found they it's it's too late. So this is the first study, to our knowledge, that's been done uh, gestationally or this early. And if we find it to be effective, um, we will share it with the other 19 home visiting models that have been um, recognized as evidence-based um, through the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, none of them have been able to um, really tackle this, this area. And, and so this is our next, our next endeavor. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen. Um, we have time just for a, a brief question before we move on to the next session, but or a comment. I just want to see if anyone has a question or comment. What percentage of families are we serving? What, what is the gap, in other words, here in Minnesota? How many families are we not serving? I mean, this program looks like it's very effective. Yep. Um, and I would hope that we have a, a objective to serve every family. So I'm curious. For home visiting? For home visiting. Yep. Uh, your program, yep. uh, how many families, and, and maybe we would need to rob in this as to what, what that cost would be. Yep. So home visiting um, in Minnesota, we have about 24, 25% um, of American Indians that live on the reservation getting services through a home visiting program as a volunteer program. So sure. they would um, sign up and, and get the home visiting. We have another about 30% in the surrounding border areas living in the towns of those areas. They may or may not be getting services through their tribe. Um, but then those are being served by local public health programs for home visitors and non-native home visitors. In our urban area, we have another about 30% of the population that are living here. And I will argue that we are not reaching into that population for home visiting at all because there's no American Indian specific urban home visiting program. So is your department, uh, is there a mission to say to bring this to scale? And have you worked the numbers out and is there a proposal? For home visiting to American Indians or yeah. family spirit? Uh, well. So, yeah, I know. Um, well, for home visiting to scale, the Advancing Health Equity Report is addressing that, and we're starting to take in data more by race, um, language, and ethnicity to see where our home visiting program is hitting. And it is, it is starkly blatant that we are not hitting into a population that has the most need, which is the American Indian population. So, yes, but we are not quite sure how we're going to approach that yet. Unfortunately, we had a series of grants go out that are not reaching into the population. I just asked Carla about some grant opportunities for McPhee. So yes and no. I mean, we, we started out with the structural racism. We brought family spirit here for our tribal partners. But no, we're not reaching into the rest of the population. Yeah. Maybe we can talk later about it. Yep. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jackie and Carla, and we're going to move on to our Next uh, speaker, we're delighted to have Tara Jean Yazi Mintz here. Uh, she's the co-director of the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs at the American Indian College Fund in Denver. So welcome to Minnesota. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. It's really exciting to uh, be a part of a group of people who are working on early childhood education in Indian country. Um, I come to you from the American Indian College Fund. Uh, our headquarters is in Denver, Colorado, and we serve tribal colleges across the country in terms of funding opportunities for scholarships on one arm of the work that we do. And on the other arm of work we do uh, is research and sponsored programs. And so in the office that I work in, uh, I also run in all of our tribal college uh, and university early education initiatives. We began this work in 2011 with a flagship program called Wakanja, our Sacred Little Ones Early Childhood Initiative. And in that work, we were beginning to embark on a journey uh, with tribal colleges in creating systems of care and learning for native children. 
So as we come to today, um, a lot of what you've heard so far at this conference are some of the principles, the values, and the practices that are all bundled together in an initiative that we're working with in uh, tribal colleges. So my job today is to talk with you about how we are um, filtering into that pipeline uh, the work around teachers. A lot of my research and my um, professional work has focused on native teachers. In particular, the question I've often asked is, how do we help teachers understand uh, and then implement curriculum that is what we call culturally relevant or culturally based or culturally responsive? There's a whole gamut of different names for the kind of curriculum that we're talking about that should be impacting our children in positive ways. So I want you to, before I begin, I want you to take a moment to think about um, a teacher. Who are the teachers or teacher that you, comes to your mind when you think of that highly engaging, highly responsive, the teacher that has created multiple learning opportunities for you in your life? And think about those qualities of who this person is to you. And in some cases, it might be a person who um, doesn't exist, but is, exists because there's a number of different people who make up who this person is. This is a question that we asked our tribal college coordinating teams when they first came together in 2011, was when we talked about who is that teacher out there in the world that has pushed you to become, to the, to become so successful that you are in a room ready to advocate for children's learning opportunities. And also, on the other side of this is asking the question, how do we envision um, a young child who is successful, who is able to um, handle all the different life changes and milestones in the ways of your people? So thinking about that from the point of view of your own tribal connection. So those two questions have been lingering and in some cases throughout the years have come to the forefront of our work and at some points it goes to the background. Almost like we talk about um, looking through a kaleidoscope. There's a lot of different colors engaged in the work that we're doing around early childhood education. And at different points in time, um, teachers come to the forefront and then they fall back into the color range and then parents come to the forefront and they fall back. And at different points, it's the child who is looking through the kaleidoscope and moving and moving and the changes of those learning opportunities are happening. So we want you to be thinking about your teachers, but I also want you to be thinking about the child and what they need and what you envision them to learn as they go through this presentation. Um, the, the early childhood education programs at, um, that we serve at the College Fund um, meet, or, or I'm sorry, they, they're a representative of all of these different tribal colleges across the country. Currently we have 37 tribal colleges, 35 of which are eligible to receive funding from the, from the American Indian College Fund. And out of the 35 that are eligible, we have approximately 23 of the tribal colleges that have early childhood education programs or degrees. Um, across these programs, we have uh, approximately 24 associate's degree programs, whether they're AA or AS degrees. And then we have six bachelor degree programs across the system. Many of these programs have, um, are starting to consider a movement into offering online degree programs as well. We have some really great programs up in um, the upper part of Michigan um, with uh, Bay Mills College. It offers an online degree program and we have a number of our sites that offer distance learning for early childhood education. Across our system of tribal colleges, we have over 17,000 students that are enrolled in some level of programming, whether it be in the trades field to earn a certificate all the way up to earning their first master's degree. So there's a large uh, continuum of work that's happening at tribal colleges. And one of the things I love about tribal colleges is that they were developed to be um, 
geographically located on or near reservations, and also to serve tribal colleges, um, are there to serve tribes' needs in terms of the critical areas of work. And so early childhood has become a critical area of work, particularly in teacher education, as we have learned with Head Start programs and other learning programs moving into the direction of needing that higher education degree in terms of a four-year bachelor's degree uh, credential. So when we look at the locations of our tribal colleges and their early education programs, there is a base at which we can start to think about these pathways to the profession, starting with those credentialing programs and moving on to the higher levels of educational degrees. At the American Indian College Fund, we have a number of initiatives which are now under the umbrella of our TCU ECE initiatives. The Wakayanja Sacred Little Ones Project, again, started in 2011 with a significant level of funding from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And this was an opportunity, I would say it was a historic opportunity for us to talk about what could we envision in terms of a sustainable system that will provide us an opportunity to train teachers locally and move forward in a way that um, helps us envision that lifelong learning track for young children. When you look at the logo of our Wakayanja project, it looks like a turtle, and it was actually not meant to look like that when we started thinking about the logo. Um, so if we start from the top, uh, that is Ila Selvik College, with the barrow um, whalebone with the child in the middle. Um, as we go to the east, this Menominee Nation with their, their sustainability and forestry is their symbol. And we go to the south, we look at Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute and the mesas and the red, the red um, landscape. And we go to the west, we're talking about Northwest Indian College and the canoe representing their connection to the sea and land and fishing. The circle that comes around is the connection of all of these flagship programs that we brought together in that first year connecting them with each other, connecting them across landscapes, and connecting them across their stories. The line, that ribbon that comes through is the pathway that is um, the journey of these young seedlings that are growing over time into the larger plant life that exists in these communities. So when we stepped back and looked at this picture, we came to looking at it as sort of a turtle. But the idea of, of this, when you come in and you zoom in at different points in time, you're able to see the distinction of these communities and their shared work to develop early childhood initiatives across their communities and within their communities. That was our launching point in 2011 as we started this initiative. And it grew into a larger uh, movement across Indian country through our tribal colleges and universities. Next came our eh, Family Engagement Early Childhood Initiative, in which we took one of our domains and focused really clearly on what does our past and our future look like with families fully engaged in the process of early childhood education. So the stories that our, our families give are gifts to the young ones in terms of their development. And so strengthening those systems of shared responsibility with families created that next step of our movement and our pathway towards developing these shared opportunities with young children. In 2014, we grew our initiative once more with a, a grant to focus on language immersion. We wanted to understand better how do we work with teachers and give them professional development opportunities, particularly around uh, language immersion practices. So in our Cultivating Lakota initiative, we focus really specifically on the Sitting Bull's uh, Lakota language nest and particularly around how can they have the opportunity to develop a full scope and sequence in their educational programming. And just this spring, we launched our, our restorative teachings initiative, which focuses on health and wellness. 
and um, developing those secure pathways for Native families to move into the future with their children's teachings. When we started the Wakanja initiative, um, each of the sites that are located on this map, again, are the central components to our flagship program. They helped us over the five years develop a pilot program that hits on a number of critical areas in the work that we're doing to create a strategic uh, strategy of educational change. We use this collective strategy of educational change, and these are cycles. And for many of you who are engaged in, in community change, this is not going to sound new to you. But what it does is it helps us articulate a way of, of doing this work, um, and in a systematic way, also developing these structures at different points in time with communities that have never done this work before. So all of our initiatives are launched with a, a visioning phase where we ask that our tribal colleges bring together a number of people who are going to engage in a co-visioning process in which they together build knowledge and scaffold structures. So they take an inventory about what's going on in their community, what are the questions that they have, and what are their visions for the children, and what are their visions for family, what are their visions for teachers. From that point, they move forward into what we call systems development. And in some of these cases, we've heard over and over through our presentations and our, and our conversations in the past day about what, what part of the system is not working. Well, we come at this from the point of view of we're not asking that question. We're actually saying we're going to build a system. So we put all those questions aside and we say, what system do we need to build in order for us to move forward together to envision, to meet the vision that we've set for ourselves? In some cases, that's building programs, it's building partners, it's building a curriculum, uh, and there's a lot of information uh, development and gathering that happens during this phase of the work. We then move into our implementation phase in which we're looking at implementing and trying out some of the curriculum products that we begin to make. And then we also ask our questions about what are some of the promising practices that are emerging. And we call them promising practices for a reason. We still want to understand what is the promise behind our vision. And are we staying close to that vision in terms of what we're building? So we look back to these promising practices as an innovation space. We want to stay in that creative and innovative space. So when we talk about um, questions that are about challenges and barriers, we hold those questions off until a later phase because this is the space that we need to be sitting in. And it's a luxurious space and it's a beautiful space in which our programs, our teachers, our parents have never had, in the cases that we're working with, they've never had the opportunity to sit there and dream and think and be in an innovative space. So when they're in that implementation stage, I love the conversation yesterday around our immersion programs when one, one of our, our teachers up here said that um, they're developing curriculum from more of a uh, trial and error. And I think that that's a beautiful space to be in, particularly when you're marking your own ground and pathway and when you're developing your own system, is that you know the ins and out of everything that you're trying. And that's the beauty of building these systems. In our fourth phase of work, we start thinking about authentic assessment. After we've tried a number of things with our teachers, with our parents, with our communities, we start to think about, well, how do we know what we know? And we hold on to that question a little bit because we want to be in that innovative space. We want to be trying things out with our communities. Um, but when we get into that place of readiness, when teachers and their parents and even the kids start asking us or sharing success stories, we know we've moved into this phase in which we can begin to document, to document in an authentic way what's happening at these sites. There was a really interesting question yesterday's lunch about uh, measurement. How do we measure this? And measurement and um, research and data, those all bring up particular conceptions about what we mean by measurement. 
And I love this part of our work when we talk about authentic assessment is how do we want to tell our story? Where does the story begin and who gets to tell it? And to me, that's a real key part of authentic assessment is asking ourselves, how do we want to tell our story? Do we want to tell our story through photography? Do we want to tell our stories through dance? Do we want to tell our stories through a song? Do we want to tell our story through a series of books that our community came together and wrote so that we can reawaken those stories that we want our children to have? And is the real measurement not just the books and the kit that came out, but is the measurement of change that happens with the families and the teachers and the children who saw the whole birthing process of a literacy kit come to life? To me, those are powerful ways to tell our story about this authentic assessment. And the final stage of our cycle is reflection, talking about sustainability and talking about how we're going to share that story, dissemination. We have a collective story to share, and I always appreciate having an opportunity to sit with others who are doing this work, who do this on a daily basis. But there is a point in time in which we have to come to the place where we reflect on what we've done, we make sense of it, we analyze it, and then we come out and we share the story with others. For our Wakanja Sacred Little Ones project, it took us to year three to get to the space where all of our teams felt ready to share. And part of the measure of being ready to share was to say, if I were going to a community to learn, for example, in year three, we were getting ready to go see Hawaii, right? They've been so renowned for all of the work that they've been doing. And one of the things I kept saying was, we're not going until we're ready to share something with them. Everybody goes there and learns and takes, but how, what did they bring to them in terms of knowledge? We're not going till we're ready to share. When we got to the point where the team started to talk about what they knew was true to them, and they had tangible evidence that they felt was theirs, that they could then give to another community, we made the arrangement. And we went to um, work with the Keiki Oka'aina program in um, Oahu. And we visited with them for a couple days. But not only with them and us, but we invited a whole contingency of other teachers from other indigenous communities to come together for a learning afternoon in which we shared knowledge with one another. We gifted knowledge to each other. And so that we all left with a, um, a practice of reflection, a practice of the story being the sustainability piece to the work that we're engaged in. We are driven by a vision and theory at the College Fund that drives everything that we're doing right now in early child education bringing together a number of leaders, tribal college presidents, parents, and project directors. This is our theory of change, in which we talk about tribal nations having their education rooted in language and in culture, and that we enact these systems and structures of tribes, and we implement that into the learning opportunities that we're providing children, teachers, and parents. Our educational sovereignty is right central to the work that we're doing. We are very interested in supporting our relationships between these institutions, children, families, communities, and that these relationships are seamless. And all of you know when you're working in these different institutions and partnerships, sometimes those relationships aren't seamless. There's a lot of work that has to go into building those systems of relationships. And we believe that tribal colleges and universities lead these restorative, they can lead these restorative practices in which we are very inclusive in terms of our community-based participatory research, the training of educators, our curriculum development, and our tribally appropriate assessments. Whatever form they may be, we are there to help develop these systems. When we've developed these systems, it's very clear 
in a number of areas. And, and I want to make a distinction here in terms of why we engage in inquiry. Our funders obviously ask that we reach certain outcomes, right? But our inquiry in this initiative is not just for our funders. We are trying to change the culture of our tribal colleges and the teachers and the project directors and the parents around what their conceptions of assessment is all about. And inquiry, asking a question, is a real key part of our work. When we ask that critical question about what we envision our children to be and what we envision their learning environment to be, that is a circle of inquiry that we encourage all of our team members to engage in. Our teams are not always ready to engage in every level of inquiry. So it's okay at some points that they're at an individual inquiry or an institutional or a community tribal level inquiry or may they may be ready for a systemic inquiry. But these are really important areas for them to keep their eyes on as they're talking about what they envision for young children and what do they envision the contributions of teachers to be for this growing of a long pathway to early learning opportunities and beyond. So when we think about this work, it's not just early childhood. We're talking about pathways from birth to early childhood, through a, a number of different systems, to adulthood, and to their elderly status. We want to be thinking about that in terms of what we're providing these teachers, right? It's through the Wakayanja five domains that we achieve this work. And again, these aren't going to sound new or exciting in some cases to anybody because you're doing this work, but together, this five domains brings together a number of very critical system uh, part, part components to the work that we're engaged in. Obviously, measuring children's cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And how we do that is through a number of different opportunities. Family and community engagement. And I say engagement because it's a departure from the idea that we have structures in schools and in centers and in institutions in which parents are invited to be involved versus parents being invited at the forefront in a visioning process to build the system in which they will be engaged. I always want to make that distinction because we have parents in the room at all times when we're engaged in this work and we want them to understand that they are a part of every aspect of the work that we're doing and their knowledge is critical. Particularly when we talk about native language and culture and even when we talk about increasing teachers' skills and their instructional quality, parents have a lot to say about those works. We're also thinking about school readiness, but I want to expand this idea of school readiness from just K-12 system. I want us to be thinking about school readiness and that interaction between home and school and home and tribe and tribe and school. So we're thinking about all of these different components in terms of school readiness. Just to take these next couple slides or just to share a little snippet of the inquiry that we've been finding around our five domains. Um, one, t one group around the improvement of early childhood education talked about how teachers were able to move to a strong focus on parents and appreciating how their child's um, culture contributes to their learning. When we talked about teachers train, again, I put that in quotes because we're talking about a different system. If you can imagine thinking about teachers' learning opportunities, right? Um, there's a number of different things that happen. And so oftentimes, the numbers play a game with us, right? We look at number one, one teacher from Ilasalvik versus the 175 teachers at Northwest Indian College. But we have to look at these numbers contextually and understand what does this mean for Ilasalvik to have one fluent Inupiaq teacher teaching 12 children in their first ever language immersion program. That's huge. That's huge. And so when we look at 
these numbers, I want us to understand that while we engage teachers in this work, we have to think about the numbers and the strategies and the purposes of teaching them. Across the initiative, we touched over 275 teachers directly and over 1,000 teachers indirectly through the work that we've been doing. In terms of community empowerment um, and family empowerment, we have the whole continual work, and many of you recognize this work when you're working with teachers and parents, right? We start out with the chaperone uh, to a field trip, and that could be an entry point. But we're getting to the place where we want parents at the table and we engage them on the other side of the continuum in terms of developing curriculum and implementing the curriculum with our children and teachers. So this is a whole continuum of work that happens, and it depends on the readiness of the community where you jump in on this continuum. So it's OK if you start out with field trips, but ultimately have the vision of a parent sitting next to you and your teachers developing curriculum. And it's OK to teach our teachers to help parents enter the classroom in that empowered way. This is something that we've learned that our tribal college um, students are not familiar with the connection between families and their children and themselves. And so we have to build those relationships. Improving children's development. There's a number, again, a continuum of work that's happening in these sites that goes to, works in language and literacy, numeracy development, socio-emotional development, fine and gross motor skills development. They're doing all this work on a continuum and bridging that K-3 system and beyond, and thinking about the relationship. We heard about that. The relationships that were established in year one have grown in year two, or sorry, three, with three families. And those families are going to represent the legacy of this program into the future. And so it's OK that we have three families that we're going to follow out of 40 families. That's the way that we can develop our research-based models around family engagement and bridging children's experiences from those early child education programs to the beyond. And native language and culture, again, a central component to our work. How do we engage this work? I love this idea of not fearing cultural protocols as barriers to progress thinking about how do you create those relationships, right? I think back to Menominee Nation. It took them about a year and a half to go through a process of getting cultural and tribal approval to retell the stories to the kids. But they went through it. And we have a whole series of 19 books that have reawakened Menominee stories. We talk about members and teams that must be adaptive and responsive to dynamic change and persistent to creative thought. Creating that space of innovation and creative thought is central to our language and cultural revitalization efforts. We have to invent what is not there. We have to invent what is taken from our communities. And so that space is so critical of our five domains. And we think about the metaphors. This is where I'll close out. Is when we look at each of these tribal colleges, yes, there's four out of 37 existing colleges that embarked on this journey to, to inspire the next generation of teachers. They had to start from a place of inspiration. And so their stories and their inspiration is captured by the metaphors that they share. For Ilasalvik, they talk about their journey as being the icebreakers. So for the, for the spring whaling season, they have to have a whole group that goes out and breaks the trail for the whalers to get their boats out to the water. And that can be miles and miles and miles. And so these teachers at Ilasalvik think of themselves as those icebreakers. And when they understand their role as an icebreaker, they understand that it's not a sacrifice necessarily, and it's not a challenge. It's their responsibility to the sustainability of their community and their program and their language. We talk about College of Menominee Nation. Their metaphor is reawakening Menominee stories. And it's through their literacy practices. And it's one of their first stories is about the forest. 
and what they learn from the forest becomes their sustainable conversation with children and families. Southwestern Indy Polytechnic Institute talks about their building nation builders through the teacher education program. Their teachers aren't just teachers, they are leaders in an effort to revitalize their connections to land, to their languages, to their communities, to their children, and to the next generation. They are nation builders. And Northwest Indian College, their metaphor is of the fishing net. The fishing net is the piece that brings them sustainability through the food that is their sustenance. And the net is the weaving of all of these relationships. So everything they do comes back to the metaphor. Their professional learning communities with their teachers is in the effort of weaving together what they're trying to capture in terms of knowledge for the children that they're teaching. So each of them, their metaphors come from a place of indigenous knowledge. It comes from a place of impact for the generations of their communities. And I want for all of you to understand that when we're engaged in this work, there's a number of us out there um, celebrating with you and taking on the next challenge with you. And I hope that you reach out to tribal colleges and universities as a partner in this effort. The American Indian College Fund is very committed to supporting tribal colleges in this effort. And um, I hope that you will follow us as we go forward in our work. We've just launched our restorative restorative teachings effort, and I would love for you to join our conversations as we're engaged through technology. And so here is our contact information. We love visiting other sites, but make sure that we bring knowledge to you as we engage in that reciprocal relationship to improve our teachers for the best. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause to our morning presenters, to Jack and Carla and Tara Jean. Wonderful information. Um, if I could have Dick and Heidi help set up this next, uh, our conversation. So we've, we've come to the time in our program where we're gonna have a chance to have some small group conversations. And I'll give you, I first wanna uh, talk to the live stream audience and say that we the live stream will be ending soon but you can participate in these discussions using uh, the hashtag for the conference uh, which is native child development and certainly weigh in on some of the topics and we have a, a resource on the website that you can see our topics uh, so the way that we will work this is we, we'll have two discussion periods uh, and then there will be a break after the second discussion period of chance for a very brief report out from the different groups. The flow of the conversation, generally speaking, will be a chance on these different topics, is to share some of the best practices from your communities, um, have a chance to identify some barriers that you have come uh, regarding these different uh, practices, uh, and then also just giving everyone a chance at the table to share your ideas. And what, I, what I'm putting up here is 10 topics that you'll probably want to go to all 10 of them, so you'll have to choose two of them uh, in order to participate in those. But um, you know, if you ended up moving between one and the other during, if, if you heard your neighbor saying something interesting and you want to weigh in over there, I'm certainly say you certainly could do that. Uh, the way it'll be set up is uh, here are the ten topics. Is that I've asked. Uh, a person at the meeting to uh, be able to sit at that table during both, both of the discussions. And as you can see, we have first building quality. So Amy uh, LaPointe, if I see Amy, no, it's hi Amy, there's Amy, will be at table number one. Um, professional development, uh, Tara Jean will be there. So there's Tara Jean. Uh, language immersion, we have Betty, Jane, and Brooke are here. Uh, she met them at the panel. Uh, yesterday. Uh, parent engagement, Terry Cross is here. And, and uh, Kristen Speakman, could you participate in that as well with Terry? I know we didn't get a chance to talk, but that would be, be awesome. Um, early childhood mental health, uh, Jackie and Carla. 
to have a discussion on that. And issues around child welfare and early childhood development. Anita Feinday is right here. Uh, advocacy for early childhood development, and this could be uh, within the tribal community, but also broadly, we have Barb Faber. And issues around federal and state policy. Linda Smith is here, so that'll be table number eight. And uh, table number nine will be healing historical trauma in the context of parents and children. We have uh, Josie Chase is here. And then I'm leaving a, a table open just to see if, if none of these topics, if you don't, if you're like, you want to weigh in on something else, we'll have an open table number 10 and we'll just see what happens at that table. Uh, so uh, what we've placed out on the tables, you can see there's a number and there's some sheets. What I'm going to ask is someone other than the facilitator at the table to volunteer just to take some notes on the conversation and to place your email on that sheet. And I promise you I'll read every word that's on that sheet, uh, summarize the discussion so we can get those main points out to all of you. So we're going to take just a few minutes here to uh, find uh, your table and we will, once you're seated, we will uh, begin the discussion.